Hey YouTube, what's up? This is the Reluctant Navi back again. Uh, this has been this is a video that's going to be um, one that's going to ask answer a lot of questions that people may have about Christianity, the religion. Um, it'll ask answer some questions that people had of me that and I told them I was going to put it in an, another video. I asked I answered some in a comment section, but this is going to be a brief history. And this is going to be like black Christians get a clue and stop being stuck on stupid. So and we're going to start off a minute. Hope y'all can hear that. And I'm going to take y'all to chat and see if y'all can remember some stuff that we used to do. Right. And, and this is the black church. Right. And I say church is because that's what we used to call it um, back when we were um, being whipped and it was being indoctrinated um, in us, right? So for those of y'all that went to church, let's see if y'all can remember this song. Remember this? Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion that's good enough for me. Oh, give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion that's good enough for me. And then everybody starts shouting like, Y'all remember that? That's give me that old time religion. Here's the problem with that. The problem with that is the old time religion that we were given. Now, for those who want to know how Christianity got started. And this is kind of no joke. Um, and who wrote the New Testament? This is who this video is for. So if y'all don't want to know the truth, y'all don't want to follow the truth, then I would advise you to go somewhere else right now because I'm about to blow everybody's mind out the water that don't already know this. All right. Now, I keep saying this. The Almighty gave us commandments, not religion. Man gave us religion and white men gave you Christianity. All right. So man gave us religion, but white man, white men gave you Christianity. And basically, the picture that you see here is Constantine. What he did was he made Christianity a the official religion of the Roman Empire. And so that's how it got spread. But the Christian religion was intended to deceive the Israelites. The black people that was whooping the Romans behind when they start trying to make us put statues up in our temples. All right. So here we go. The New Testament was written by Romans. All right. The Piso family or Piso family. Um. Um, the Vespasians, the Flavians, all right, and Constantine. Now, as you know, that when the Romans do something, when they become emperor or Caesars, they put their stamp in on something. Like we have extra days in a month and extra days in a year and extra months in the year because of the Romans. We have July for Julius Caesar and then August uh, um, Augustus couldn't be outdone by that. So he added a day. Right. And so Augustus Caesar added. So the Roman calendar that we follow have days that are added, not because they made sense, but because of the vanity of the Roman emperor at the time. So we got. Um, 
Ju July for Julius Caesar, um, August for Augustus Caesar. All right. So understand this. The same way that they would um, make their name known so that people would follow them or always worship them in some way. As far as the calendar, they also did this with religious documents that they can find. All right. So uh, let's just get into this um, real quick. This was a problem for the Romans. One. These are the commandments. And this is Elohim saying these words um, that we shall worship no other mighty ones before his face. All right. We should not make any image of any likeness which that, uh, that is in the heavens above or which is in the earth beneath or which is in the water. We do not bow down to them or serve them. It says, for I, Yahweh, your Elohim, am a jealous El, visiting the crookedness of the fathers on the children in the third and fourth generations who hate me. So if you bow down to anything else, worship anything else, have an image of anything else that you pray to or worship, i.e. a white man when you close your eyes um, and you pray to and worship that, all right, then you hate the Almighty. Basically, that's what that says. All right. So let's get into it and see how much people really hate the almighty, because that's what he's really saying in this. All right. So pay attention, people. This is going to be earth shattering for some of y'all. The presentation of the Jesus character, it's somewhat of a composite of many messianic leaders of the time. Well, let's just go back to the drawing board and uh, we'll leave aside all of the assumptions of Christian history and let's just look at the text afresh and consider every possibility. Let's, uh, let's open the whole game up. Can you think that Christianity is really paganism by a different name? Uh, now it feels completely obvious. Some of us are saying that this was a son God turned into a Jewish man. In all of this, we're dealing with literature. We're not dealing with history. So the answer is no, there is no um, history to this character of Jesus. It's entirely a literary creation. Some of our Bible scholars are mavericks, working outside the restrictions of mainstream religious institutions. This allows them the freedom to provide fresh insights and draw some startling conclusions about how Christianity was formed. I began reading a number of books on the subject. This turned into a decade-long research. For Joseph Atwell, the key was in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the only Jewish literature ever discovered from the first century AD or CE, the time that Jesus would have been preaching among the Jews. The characters in the Dead Sea Scrolls were militaristic, and you could see that this movement wanted to push the foreigners out of Israel. They were fundamentalists, whereas the characters in the Gospel are different. They are pacifistic. They are turning the other cheek. They're giving to Caesar what is Caesar's. How did a movement like Christianity come to exist in a region that was occupied by Roman soldiers and had Jewish zealots within it that were going to push these Romans out? How was that possible? I began studying the other two major works of the era. The New Testament and Wars of the Jews by Josephus, a Roman court historian who described the war between the Romans and the Jews in the first century. While reading these works side by side, I noticed an amazing connection between them. Certain events from the ministry of Jesus seem to closely parallel episodes from the military campaign of Roman Caesar Titus Flavius, a campaign which took place 40 years after Jesus supposedly lived. My efforts to understand these connections led me to an incredible discovery. Christianity had been invented by a little-known family of Roman Caesars, the Flavians. 
and they left us documents to prove it. The Flavians uh, are not a household name, and yet it's the Flavians who completely reshaped the Roman Empire. In Rome, of course, there's the, there's the Colosseum, which is uh, understood to be the best known monument of the ancient Roman Empire, perhaps. The Colosseum is, in fact, a Flavian construction produced during the Flavian period. It's under the Flavians that both Rabbinic Judaism and Christianity take shape. Why would the Flavians be interested in creating religions? Much like today, their era was marked by political power struggles, a bankrupt economy, religious conflicts, and endless wars. In the midst of this turmoil, the Flavians seized control of the Roman Empire and ushered in an immense paradigm shift. To understand the Flavians' rise to power, we need to go back to the reign of the previous powerful rulers, the Julio-Claudian dynasty. Beginning with Julius Caesar in the year 49 BCE, the Julio-Claudians ruled Rome for over a hundred years transforming the government from a republic into an empire. This family contained all the famous Caesars. Julius, who predated the time of Jesus, Augustus, who was Caesar at the time of Jesus' supposed birth, Tiberius, who ruled during Jesus' supposed death, followed by the infamous Caligula, then Claudius, and ending the Julio-Claudian dynasty with Nero whose reign begins in 54 CE. The Julio-Claudians enjoyed a godlike status until the family degenerated and began to damage the Roman Empire. By the time of Nero, his famous decadence was bankrupting the empire, and the Jews of Judea were staging a huge rebellion against their Roman rulers. Judea was one of the many conquered provinces that made up the Roman Empire. This region, which was also known as Palestine, was controlled by a family that served as Rome's tax collector, the Herods. They were a Greco-Arab family, somewhat possibly Judaized, though only Judaized when it was convenient to please the subjects they were given, who were put in power in Palestine and destroyed the previous Jewish ruling family, the Maccabean family, root and stalk. Besides being heavily taxed and ruled by a non-Jewish family put in power by Rome, the Jews were further inflamed by the requirement that a statue of the Caesar be placed for worship in every temple throughout the empire. In the Roman Empire, you could pretty much have any god you want, but legally you had to submit to the emperor as a god as well. You had to at least acknowledge that the, uh, the Roman leader was also a divine figure. But the Jews would not have any of it. It's fundamental to Jewish belief that you shall make no graven images. It's one of the, the commandments and, and given at Sinai um, by God. So the Jews never made representations of God. The Jews had a very different type of religion. They had a religion which was much more focused on the book and less focused upon cultic statues. This presented a real problem for the Romans. They tried to install statues of Caesar, but uh, the Jews weren't going to buy that at all. In fact, it aggravated them. It enraged them. And the, the Romans really, I, I think, didn't understand this. It's not statues, it's books. And those books contained what are known as the Jewish messianic prophecies. The thing that most moved the Jews' revolt against Rome was an obscure prophecy from among their writings that a world ruler would come out of Palestine. Holy books inspired the Jews to expect a redeemer who would redeem Israel, rescue Israel, restore Israel to power and leadership in the world. The Messiah that the literature described was a warrior. The Messiahs would have claimed the same attributes that David did. David could overcome any army because God gave him the power to do it. If you had the power of God, you could easily defeat the Roman army. 
the people rebelled against Rome and were led by a messianic movement that had a series of messiahs that had come forward to fight against the Roman Empire. The Hebrew word Messiah is translated into Greek as Christos or Christ, so the title of Christ can describe any of the numerous messiahs of this movement. Yes, the word Christ or Christians can uh, refer to the Palestine Messianic movement, um, but it's a later term, it's a later reformulation of the Messianic movement in Palestine. This movement rebels against Rome in 66 and is successful. It actually defeats them militarily, so it must have been a huge movement. The victorious Jews set up a nation state directly in the Roman Empire. And the Romans had to do something about it. There was a real danger that this messianic movement could not only boil over in Judea itself, but could spread to other Jewish communities and other parts of the Roman Empire. Rome ruled its colonies with a rod of iron and any resistance was going to be met with brute force. At this time during Nero's reign, two of the finest military men in the empire were the Flavians, Vespasian and his son Titus. Vespasian and Titus were military men. They spent a great deal of their life outside of Rome. For over a decade, they had waged war against the Druids in Brittany and Gaul. Vespasian and Titus were successful in essentially destroying the Druids. They left behind no historical record of their existence. And it's the Flavians that Nero calls upon when he needs to suppress the Jews' rebellion in Judea. Nero responded by asking his best general, Vespasian, and his son Titus to go into Judea with a huge army, 60, 70,000 troops, and a similar number of support individuals. So they meant business. The Romans came down to crush the rebellion. In the year 66 CE, the Flavians begin their military campaign against the Jews. They start further north in Galilee, where the first of three key events takes place. They destroy the Jewish towns of Galilee. They also capture a Jewish rebel who later becomes a critical figure in the formulation of Christianity. This is where they captured one of the leaders of the rebellion, a Jew named Josephus bar Matthias. Now, Josephus presented himself to the Flavians as a prophet. Okay, folks, so there you have it, the Flavians. Um, uh, and this was a Roman dynasty, and they then became the emperors of Rome. And they used Josephus to write the New Testament. The Flavius and Josephus wrote the New Testament in order to get the um, Israelites, not Jews, but Israelites, because that's what they were called back then, black people that were Israelites. Um, they needed to get them to not worship the commandments, not follow the commandments. Now, I will point out that another mistake that um, if you listen to what the commentators or what the um, people said, one of the other mistakes that we made is we were looking for a Messiah not to bring justice to the world or not to bring justice for us. Still, again, we wanted a king seeking power. And this is why we never been able to come out of that mar and muck that we were in. Because we always want something. We want power just like everybody else. And we're not supposed to want power. We're supposed to want justice. And we're supposed to want just reign. And, and in that, that's how we serve the Almighty. So pay attention to what the Israelites were after back then. And, and when we set up that kingdom, um, we were seeking power. Period. Not righteousness, not justice. All right. So here's some little more information on the Flavians. All right. Now. You, you have something next and pay attention. Jesus's followers were fed to wild animals for Roman entertainment. 
Then, as the story goes, the Roman Emperor Constantine had a vision of the cross, which inspired him to adopt Jesus as his savior. As a result, the West became Christian. But did Constantine really convert to Christianity? Or are modern Christians worshiping a version of Jesus created by a die-hard pagan? Decoding the Ancients is the job of investigative journalist Simka Yakubovich. From deserts to tombs, from Rome to the Holy Land, Simka tracks down the truth behind historical myths, long-held beliefs, and some of the greatest biblical stories ever told. Simka has come to Turkey, to the city of Istanbul. Back in the 4th century AD, Constantine built his new capital here and called it Constantinople. By that point, Constantine had already legalized Christianity. But it's still a matter of controversy whether Constantine himself became a true Christian. I'm underneath modern Istanbul, the city that Constantine built. Until Constantine, some 300 years after the crucifixion, Christianity was essentially an illegal movement. After Constantine, within a few years, a few decades, it would become the official religion of the Roman Empire and the reason why so much of the world today is Christian. The question is, who was he? And the religion that he created, is it a religion that Jesus would recognize? In the fourth century AD, the Roman Empire was divided into four major areas. Each region had its own ruler. But when Constantine's father, who ruled the West, died in York, England in the year 306, his army declared Constantine ruler of the entire Roman Empire. This sparked a bloody struggle to determine who would end up emperor. In the year 312, Constantine was pitted against the general Maxentius, who controlled the central region, including the city of Rome. Their famous struggle for power was depicted 1,200 years later in these frescoes by Renaissance artist Raphael. Based on early Christian sources, Raphael painted these narratives on the Vatican walls and it's these frescoes that tell us the traditional story of how Constantine converted to Christianity. But there's a much older work of art that tells a different tale. It's called the Arch of Constantine. And Constantine himself had it built here, in the center of Rome, to celebrate his victory over Maxentius. Over six stories high, Constantine's arch was erected just 91 meters from the Colosseum, where Christians were once killed for sport. For fear of damage, the Department of Antiquities in Rome hasn't given anyone permission to examine it up close for more than 30 years. Until now. The closest you can get to Constantine is the arch behind me across from the Colosseum. It's Constantine's victory arch, and on it he sculpted his narrative. The problem is you can't get close to it. In 30 years, no one has. But now, we're gonna go up and take a look. In his quest to decode the arch, Simca is joined by Constantine expert Elizabeth Marlowe, who has seen the carvings on Constantine's arch only from ground level or in photographs. Until now, she has never seen them up close. Oh my God, look at that. That is so fantastic. Look how big they are. From this elevated perspective, Simca can now see how Constantine wanted his victory over Maxentius depicted in stone for all time. This is amazing. I'm excited. It's like spectacular a to be up here. Everyone should see Constantine's arch this way. Constantine's arch depicts the battle between Constantine and Maxentius for strategic control of the Milvian Bridge, just north of Rome. According to the tradition depicted in Raphael's paintings, Constantine's forces were greatly outnumbered. But then, Constantine is said to have had a vision of the cross, followed by a dream of Jesus that changed his life, and ours, forever. In that moment, 
Constantine was said to have denounced the Roman paganism that he was brought up with in favor of a newfound belief in Christianity. He ordered his soldiers to paint their shields and banners with the symbol of the cross and led his army to victory. He then went on to convert the entire Roman world to the Christian faith. That's what the Christian tradition tells us. But what does Constantine's arch have to say? In this panel, Constantine's face was deliberately hacked out by a long forgotten opponent to his legacy. Here, we can still clearly see the defeated Maxentius drowning in the river Tiber. But is there any evidence that Constantine really had a vision of the cross that converted him to Christianity? Who's that guy behind him? That's one of his own men carrying a standard. That's a military standard. No cross there. No cross there. You can't see that from down below. No. I see a shield very clearly. Yes. No cross there. No, no. When we look at the evidence from Constantine's reign itself, the Arch of Constantine really being the best source we have in the years immediately following that battle, there's no trace of Christianity on this monument. No images of Jesus, no crosses, no Christian symbolism anywhere on his arch. Considering his vision, you would think Constantine would be championing Christianity. Is it possible that there was no vision at all? In Constantine's day, emperors had to win over Roman armor. Was the vision invented to win over Christian soldiers? But wait a minute, the Roman army persecuted Christians. It crucified Jesus. There wouldn't have been Christians in the Roman army. Maybe there were. Okay. Now, um, this is um, Constantine, Osiris, Mithra, and Christianity. Um, it's a History Channel 2 expose on Christianity. And you can find it on YouTube. The other um, uh, audio y'all heard, you can also find that on YouTube, right? But um, I played it because I want you to understand. They go in deeper that all the signs on his arch were pagan. And it shows that he was actually worshiping the um, sun god Apollo, the god of war. And that's what he did immediately after beating Maxentian at the Milvian Bridge, okay? And so, and it goes deeper into that, but for time's sake, I just cut it there, all right? Now, um, under Constantine, Christianity became an empirically sponsored religion, right? But as you know, um, it's a mix of paganism and rabbinic Judaism, right? But Jew rabbinic Judaism, as you heard, was the other thing that the Romans tolerated and the rabbinic Judaism or with, ra with rabbis, anything that have a pre um, have preachers, priests and rabbis, that's not that's not godly. That's putting a man in charge of people. But each man was supposed to be a leader unto his own house. If you look at the commandments, it's supposed to be husband and then he leads his wife and children. And that's how it was always um, done. Even when we were meeting um, from house to house, there was no set leader. If you want to follow what the apostles did or whatever. All right. Now, for what we know, the apostles, that's also fake and false. All right. And Josephus is Saul or Paul, just under a different name. All right, so this is showing you how they manipulated the scriptures to get people from following the commandments for reasons that um, the video points out and to follow paganism and started starting to worship the Romans as gods. So, yes, black woman, you're still worshiping your Jesus, your white man. That's who you're really worshiping. Is not the Almighty. All right. So, um, look at this one that poster, dead or alive. Constantine, one, he changed the um, Sabbath um, from 
um, the seventh day to the first day, from Saturday to seventh day to the first day, Sunday. And for you idiots that say Sunday is the um, seventh day, it can't be the seventh and the first day. And you idiots know it's the um, first day is because you sound, celebrate Easter on Easter Sunday, the first day of the week in accordance with Matthew. So that's why I'm calling you idiots, because you'll sit up there on Easter Sunday. Yes. And Jesus got up on the first day of the week on Easter Sunday. And then you're going to leave out and say it's the seventh day also. That's just stupidity. That's why I put stop being stuck on stupid. All right. Um, he invented Catholicism. Christianity is Catholicism. Catholicism is Christianity. Um, the churches y'all in now is come from the Protestant Reformation which was started by Martin Luther. But before that, everybody that was Christian was Catholic, you idiots. Also stuck on stupid. Not wanting to study your history, the history of your religion. Now, I will say this for the Egyptologists. I will say this for the Muslims. At least they study the background as to why they believe what they believe. I'm going to disagree with them, yeah. But I can respect that the Egyptologists, they're coming from, well, we worship these symbols and stuff because these are our gods. And I'm with them, okay? I ain't with them about that because um, I don't worship symbols and stuff. But I'm with them in that they will go and get knowledge and know what this stuff means. They know the history of the Anka. They know the history of whatever. They know the history of the people that they get their crap from, right? But Christians... They don't go back and study crap. They just get up there and listen to a white man or a black man sit up there, tell them what to think, and then they think it. All right. Um, so you got the um, Nicene Council in 325. All right. Um, and so bis basically, this is what um, they did. All right. Now, um, and I left this information down here for uh tarzone.net for people that, that want to study and stuff like that so check them out they got a phone number and everything here too all right um many pagan temples were converted to christian worship and stuff like that right so that's just um the black temple so what all they did was they took pagan temples and then converted them to christian worship All right, and so next we have the pagan holidays. You got the win um, winter solstice, the summer solstice. All right, you got all your um, holidays here. So just pause this and take a look at it, right? All right, now, so the Trinity thing, where did that come from? The Trinity, the three God thing. If the commandment says, there, uh, I am Yahweh, your Elohim, um, um, that brought you out of the land of Mistram, y'all shall have no other mighty ones before my face. How did we come up with the Trinity then? All right. Don't that look like Egyptology? So when the Egyptologist says that Christians um, have part of Egyptology in them, they're telling the truth. All right. They are telling the truth. You can't fault them for that. Uh, but again, I, I'm saying that they study their stuff, but um, Christians just want to remain stuck on stupid. Excavators pulled up the floor of the church and discovered one of the largest Mithraic temples ever found. In cavernous, dark rooms like these, the Roman elite would worship in secret. This is amazing. I feel like I'm in the Notre Dame Cathedral of Mithraism. <laughs> well, this is a pretty sizable one. The idea is, is this is a recreation of the primal cave where Mithras commits the sacrifice of the bull, which is the core event in Mithraism. The one source of light in this dark temple illuminates the centerpiece, a bas relief that depicts the main myth of Mithraic belief. Jutting out from the primordial rock, the sun god Mithras, the son of the sun, slaughters the sacrificial bull. And through the shedding of his blood, the universe is created anew. 
Essentially, what we're seeing is Mithras being seen as the key creator god who makes possible the regeneration of life. And you've got the primordial rock, you know, the cocoon out of which the whole universe is born. Impressive, but it also sounds pretty pagan. And yet, a strange inscription here suggests a more Christian approach. We don't have many inscriptions of Mithras. Right. It's a secret, and they didn't write that much. This is unusual, this place, that it does have a very faded inscription. That now. is correct. One particular text, the Latin, translates as, and you have saved us through the shedding of the eternal blood. You have saved us through the shedding of the eternal blood. Yes. So here, the central bloodletting yes. is seen as an act of salvation. Yes, and the, the key event in the whole nature of cosmic creation and the whole nature of life. Mithras sacrifices the bull and spills its blood. Strangely corresponding to the Christian concept of Jesus offering his own blood to save mankind. But the similarities don't end there. A lot of the Mithraic rituals very closely corresponded to what the Christians would do in their worship. The sacred meal that they would participate in is taking the body or the blood of this sacrifice by sharing a meal of bread and wine. Here? Here. So it's communion. It's a basically a communion, a Eucharist. And those who partake in this feast will live forever. So just as Christians reenact the Last Supper with Jesus before his death, a form of communion was also practiced here. And just as Jesus died and was resurrected, so was Mithras. Which is why at this altar, Mithras is pictured right next to a sculpture of an Egyptian god. And this particular god, if you look carefully at his forehead, you notice that little lock that hangs yeah. down there? That actually would signify that he is the reconfiguration of the god Osiris. And Osiris is the dying exactly. and resurrected right. god of the Egyptians. Right. Just like Christians, Mithraeus believed in the concept of resurrection, which may explain why both religions were popular to members of the Roman military. Okay. Now, are you Christians stuck on stupid that's been arguing with them Egyptologists when the Egyptologists said that you just copied their religion and their gods and stuff? Y'all owe them an, an, an apology. Period. Now, I wanted to show y'all where the Holy Communion that y'all do every Sunday come from. You are actually worshiping the god Mithras. And it was installed by the Romans to keep the office officers intact in their armies. So the, um, the body and blood that you're drinking to, yes, is to the bull that was sacrificed by Mithras, the son of the sun god. So the son of God, Mithras, sacrificing the blood for the saving of the world well you you heard it from history now in matthews let's look at what um yahawasha that that's what the dude with one of the messiah's name was he says now the first day of the um feast of unleavened bread okay understand this this is the feast of unleavened bread that we are to keep in accordance with the commandments Right. The disciples came to Yahweh saying, that's um, Jesus, um, uh, saying to him, where would um, where wilt thou that we prepare for the Passover? Now, I'm using the King James Version here so that y'all can see that this is actually in the King James Version. So this is in one of my deep history, history, history Bibles. Um, um, one of the ancient Bibles that I use, the more accurate one. I'm telling you what's in the King James Bible. That he, that the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, which is called the Passover, is what, excuse me, what would Jesus do? That's what he did in the King James Bible. So let me read that the way you 
Christians would understand it. Now, the first day of the week, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to such a man, and say to, unto him, The master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the what? Passover. No, I will keep the communion. No, I will keep the birthday. No, I will keep the sun god worship. No, I will keep the Passover at thine house with at thine house with my disciples. And the disciples did as um Jesus as appointed um had appointed them. And they made ready the Passover. Now, when even was come in the evening. So as we know, um, according to scripture, the evening and the morning is a day. In Genesis, in the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Da, 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 and evening and the morning was the first day. And then when he created the stars of the evening and the morning was the second day. So go look at Genesis and just read and you will understand that. So when evening was come, he sat down with the twelve. Now let's go into Mark 14 chapter. That was Matthew 26. Um, 17 through 20. Now, Mark 14. Mark was the old, is the oldest um, gospel in in the Bible. Matthew, the person, people that wrote Matthew and the people that wrote Luke use Mark as a reference. Is Matthew and Luke are called quail documents because the guy named Luke and Matthew did not write it. They don't know who. So they call them the Q documents or the Quell documents because nobody knows who actually wrote them. All right. The dude that wrote Mark, nobody knows who wrote that. They just put a name to it. But it's older than Matthew and Luke. Nobody knows who wrote John either. A dude named John did not write John. OK, now and he, it says in Mark 14 and 13. And he ascend and he sent forth two of his disciples and said to them, go into the go ye into the city. And there shall meet you a man bearing a pitcher of water. Follow him. And wheresoever he shall go, say to the good man of the house. Master said, uh, where is the guest chamber where I shall eat Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and prepared. Make ready for us. Passover, people, is about the Passover. All right, that's the Gospels. That's what, quote, unquote, Jesus is asking them to do from out of his own mouth, right? So let's get to Corinthians and stuff like that and find out how um, communion. Corinthians 11 and 23, for I have received of the Lord, which I saw also deliver unto you that the Lord Jesus the same night which he was betrayed, took bread, and he had given thanks and break it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And after that same manner, he took a cup and he had something saying, This is the cup of the New Testament in, in, this, in my blood. This do ye as often as you drink it, remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord's death until he comes. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup, the Lord unworthily, of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself. Now, don't that sound like the Mithra, what the Mithras people were doing? Now, here's the difference. For those of you that's been in um, black churches, communion lasts about a good five minutes to a half hour but the actual ceremony itself lasts about a good two seconds and um take eat you take the bread you eat it take drink and you drink this little grape juice out of this little cup right but let a man examine himself to eat the bread and drink the cup for he has eaten and drink it on whether he eat and drink to drink of damnation until himself not discerning the lord's body right all that body and blood drinking and stuff like that that's not passover Passover is a seven day long feast of unleavened bread that starts on the Seder or the Fasash Seder, right? Um, and it's seven days long of unleavened bread. 
So how did seven lays long that starts with two Seder meals? All right. And it's a meal that takes a couple of hours because you do it with your family. You prepare, you get rid of all the leavening in your house. All right. You prepare the meal and you start the week, the seven days with this meal. And the meal is a meal. It's dinner. With wine and 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 meat and unleavened bread and bitter herbs and stuff like that. How do how does that turn into a two second um eat some cracker, drink some grape juice? You 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 understand? All right. So this is why I say Christians are stuck on stupid. If you haven't learned by now you're following a false god, then you are actually stuck on stupid. So here is my final thoughts. These are questions that one should ask oneself. And I should do your, do a, a continuation within this thing. All right? Because these videos run kind of long, but um, it's important, right? If you believe in the commandments, then why take the uh, Romans word for a man becoming a god? Becoming God. How do you believe in man and in a man as God? Hence the Trinity. Jesus as God. If you believe in the commandments, if you understand the commandments. Why is the God you believe in always pictured as a killed? Um, uh, always pictured as killed by the power of the Romans crucified on the cross. You notice when um, the Romans have you worshiping wood and stone, which in the commandments you're not supposed to be worshiping wood and stone, but you're worshiping that crucifix. It's always a white dude hung, head bent down, defeated, killed. Dead. How did they get you and sucker you into worshiping a dead man and seeing the image of a dead man and bowing down to the image of a dead man? Why is the Christian God not pictured living, judging the Romans for their evil? Because they did a lot of evil. Okay, and for that matter. Why is there an image of a Christian God in any form to be worshipped? If the Christians say they follow the Bible and the Bible contains the scriptures, the Bible is not the scriptures, but the Bible contains scriptures. The scriptures are the commandments. And I shall read Exodus 20 and 1. And Elohim spoke these words saying, I am Yahweh, your Elohim. Who brought you out of the land of Mistraim, out of the house of slavery? You shall have no other mighty ones against my face. You do not make for yourself a card image or any likeness of that which is in the heaven above, or which is in the earth beneath, or which is in the waters under the earth. Understand that? That's images or statues. Pictures or statues, right? You do not bow down to them nor serve them. So for all of you serving this white man hung on the cross or this white man's picture in the back of your church, if you close your eyes and, and look for Jesus and you see any man that comes to your thoughts when you're praying, then you're praying to a pagan and a demon. All right. So close your eyes and pray. If, if I want you to pray, close your eyes and pray. That's why I don't want none of you black women praying for me. Always trying to pray for them. I'll send out prayers. for. I don't want you praying for me. Oh, evil something praying to some demon. All right. It says for I, Yahweh, your Elohim, am a jealous L. Elohim is plural. That means there are more than one of them. But the one we serve is the L, Yahweh. Right. And he is a jealous one. That's the one that created the heavens and earth. And he visited, and that's the one of the commandments, visiting the crookedness of the fathers on the children on the third, fourth generation of those who hate me. So if you do not follow these commands, then you hate the almighty. 
but showing kindness to thousands, to those who love me and guard my commands. Remember, men, this is our purpose. We are to guard his commands. Women, your purpose is to follow us. Period. You're not equal to us. You're not the same as us. You do not have our authority as men because you are a wool man and you were the one that lost that when you took the fruit thing during the fruit incident. All right. So my final thoughts is you stupid ate up Christians need to get a clue and don't come to my page with that Christian stuff. And all the rest of you Negroes out there coming to my page, um, trying to tell me how to run my page and coming to my page, trying to defend the evil that these women are doing. You need to um, stay off my page, um, not my page, but my um, channel. You need to stay off my channel, period. You can come to my channel to look, to listen. You can make qu comments or ask questions about the content. But you can't tell me how to run my channel. It's because I look at all y'all as demonic anyway, running around watching all these demons. But I, I, I give the I give the Muslims this. They study their stuff. All right. I'm not in all the way agreements agreeing um, with them either. Right. But I can respect them. Because they have some stuff. They at least they study. Right. I'm not here to convert anybody to anything. This message is out here, but I'm here, I'm, a, I'm here to call out stupidity where I see it. And I see some stupidity. All right. So, again, I am saying. These you Christians, you need to stop being stuck on stupid. Get a clue. With that said, I'm out.